It may be 12 noon in America, but it's 5 o'clock in London, and our guest, Kirsch Agrawal, is going to be with us today. Kirsch, what are you going to talk about? Hey, Eric. So today we'll talk about how we can create drama using watercolors and uh, apply it to your landscapes. Okay, so when you talk about drama, what does that mean? Uh, drama, I mean, it comes from the position of contrast and a bit of narrative, a storytelling, and using visual tools to really creating that opposing forces that captures the audience. Okay, so the reason this is important, everybody, by the way, drama for any kind of painting, not just watercolor, but he's going to demonstrate it in watercolor. Uh, yeah. Harsh was a uh, an animator, worked for many uh, companies in the entertainment industry. He knows all about creating paintings and storytelling, and now he's a full-time painter. So why don't we get started? Uh, go ahead. Let's get these lessons going, shall we? Let's do it, Eric. All right. Okay. Here we go. Well, um, hello, everyone. So today, um, as we discussed, we'll talk about creating drama using watercolors. And, uh, you know, uh, my history is in filmmaking, and uh, we say story is king. Usually, um, you would have characters and uh, humans and, and, and people would be able to empathize with them and lots of emotion, expression and these things. But then when we do landscapes, it becomes a bit tricky because you don't have those uh, portraits and close-up faces to look at. Uh, but then as an artist, we do have a lot of visual tools um, that can help us create um, create drama and uh, uh, be able to engage engage our audiences. Um, so what we're going to do today, as you can see on your screen, there are two pictures. These are some of the photographs that I took a couple of weeks back in Norfolk. Um, it's haystacks, and actually it was my first time looking at these massive haystacks, and uh, that got me really excited. And um, um, I usually paint a lot uh, outdoors, and uh, it was a nice sunny day, as you can see. There were some shadows and things. Um, um, but then all of a sudden there were these like stormy clouds that came in and it started to rain a little bit and uh, and people were putting tarps on on the haystack to protect them from rain and it was uh, but it, again it was like a nice scene so that's sort of the story that uh, you know uh, we're gonna try to capture today um, now before we begin our um, the first step of the process looking is is going to be composition now. We will look at it briefly. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into composition, but I, I do want to dive a little into different aspects that can help you create a bit of drama. Um, now, if you if you closely look at this picture, yes, you can copy the picture as is, but it doesn't look as exciting on its own. And so um, it definitely needs help in order to uh, make it more engaging. Um, so let's look into how we can get to it. So you can see there's a lot of different details in different places. And the first thing that I want to do is really focus on what kind of um, area I'm interested in. Now, imagine when you are in the location, I actually spend like 20% to 30% of my time um, just scouting for subjects. And when I'm looking for subjects, I'm looking at, you know, this haystack like at different angles, how it looks at what kind of light and shadow there is, what kind of shape composition. And then once I'm happy with it, I set up my easel there and start painting. So in this case, I thought I, I definitely liked this angle because it has a leading line into it. Uh, I also like the way a bunch of these haystacks are lit up top and there's like the certain light direction which is coming this way. Um, so first off, we're going to create like a framing for it. And I think I will kind of crop the picture um, because only like this much. I Actually, I don't want to include a lot of this. I'm going to probably crop a bit more and uh, something something along along this line. And uh, um, when you do composition, I'm like initially thinking of just like two values. So I could, uh, I've done a little thumbnail over here, as you can see, of like cropping. Okay, uh, so cropping for everybody's image. benefit, just explain what values are because some people don't know. Um, so values would be how light or dark uh, something is. And you, you can go like all the way from white to black. And then there's, you know, thousands of values in between. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of like converting from analog to digital. And uh, um, I would say initially, if you're able to really tell what your subject is and what kind of story you're trying to tell just with two values or maybe three, um, you know, uh, it's a, it's an easier way to to convey that story because you want to keep it simple. The thing is, you can make it sophisticated. Uh, I can go ahead and add all the details, but that's really gonna 
um, um, kill the painting. You don't want to overwhelm your viewers. You want to uh, make it simple, but also keep it interesting at the same time. So um, as you can see through this thumbnail that I've really connected this whole shape, which is going to be um, um, our haystack. And then uh, this little bit of pile here, also the trees and also this haystack on the side, this whole thing could be just one, one big shape. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, there's no shadows here, but then you can see the light direction. So I've invented this shadow over here, which I mean, it doesn't exist, but then it definitely helps with the story to kind of um, really frame this. And uh, what this is doing is multiple things. One, it's anchoring, you know, our dark and let's say almost like the, you know, just like in Yang, it's basically really, you can see, see sort of our dark and lights kind of anchoring and it's like a solid thing versus something loose where you just divide it and it's like half white and half black or something of that nature. Um, uh, one thing I would say is, even though it is this way, uh, right now my eye really travels all around and it's not really focused. So there's uh, one thing that we can do is we can create, you can use gradients. Um, so for sky, I'm, I think I'm gonna make it a bit dark and stormy. That's gonna also help with our story and it's gonna be lighter as it goes down. And uh, same for the ground, I think, because I really want them to focus on this area, I'm gonna uh, do a gradient the other way. So essentially it's almost like a diagonal kind of gradient. And what this does is really, really increase that impact that you're getting in this area. And okay, this becomes tell me why high, you want high to contrast. Draw, tell me why you want to draw the the eye to that area. That's your, your center of interest, so to speak. Yes, yes, it is. And uh, that's mainly because of our light. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add some a figure of this worker because, you know, uh, I want to show that these people just came in actively as soon as the storm arrived. And then they they are now like uh, putting tarp on this and I want to make it a bit more dynamic. Um, but then I also don't want this to be, I mean, even though this is my primary focus, I still want the eye to move around the painting. So uh, what I'm going to do is actually around this haystack in this dark area, I'm actually going to add a little bit of uh, white uh, over there, which um, you know, sort of like a secondary focal point uh, um, so that your eye goes here and then it goes over here and then it moves around the picture. Um, but because we have these dark to light gradients, as soon as you try to go outside the painting, it will sort of bring you back into, into, into the image. Well, this is sort of the thought process that I'm going through. Um, now, usually when I'm outside doing plein air painting, I'm not really doing thumbnails, uh, but then in the studio, if I'm making a bigger picture, I am. Uh, not to say that uh, you shouldn't be doing, you should be doing thumbnails, but then I'm doing these thumbnails just through my mind's eye because while scouting, I'm looking at multiple objects and it's kind of like long exposure photography uh, where, um, you know, you're standing there for 10 minutes and within those 10 minutes, you have all these activity going on, people coming in and out, weather is changing, light is changing, and you try to really um, pick and choose what interests you and how you want to tell your own story versus it just being, uh, you know, too literal. All right. So I think what we'll do is we'll get the show started here and then we'll we'll continue on yeah. with your painting. All right. Yeah, the sound Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host, Eric Rose. Our guest today, what a great guy. I met him at the Plein Air Convention, and here he is on the show now. Um, Hirsch Agarwal, and Hirsch is an incredible painter, uh, incredible watercolorist, used to be a full-time uh, artist in the animation and film industry, and now he's making his living as a painter and obviously going to be making a good one, as good as he is. So you're going to learn from him. Today, we're talking about composition, creating drama in your paintings, and uh, a whole lot more. You're going to learn from this reference image. Uh, we have a prize, and the prize is the easel brush clip. Uh, I'm seeing them worldwide now, and you can uh, clip it onto your easel. I had mine out just this weekend. I was I was uh, painting with it, and uh, that way your brushes are right there at your fingertips. And if you leave a comment, you have a chance to be chosen as the winner of an easel brush clip. The winner of our last prize, Edgaro Caravana in Henderson, Nevada, makes uh, gets this book, Make More Money, Selling Your Art. We have a free gift for you. It's 101 watercolor painting tips, tricks, and techniques, and it's yours. Just go to watercolorlive.com slash 101 tips. And of course, you can subscribe. We are here daily at 12 noon on YouTube, also pushing it out on other media. 
And uh, you can subscribe on YouTube. Just go there, hit the subscribe button, and then follow as well. Hit the little bell so that you get notified when we go live. All right, just look up Art School Live. Okay, now back to our guest. Here we go. Ursh, are you ready? Yeah, uh, Eric. So basically, um, what I've done while <laughs> you were gone is uh, we have gotten this like sketch done. And uh, um, what I wanted to show you was, because we have limited time, uh, also I wanted to uh, show some watercolor techniques. So as we had discussed before, we wanted to do some gradients. Gradients are really, uh, really helpful to um, um, especially um, guide your eyes from one direction to other, uh, at least especially in watercolors, I think. Um, so what I'm going to show you is some of the washes that uh, how I start my painting. And then uh, once it's done at mid stage, we're going to switch to a more advanced painting where we're going to learn how we can add some shadows and um, um, people to uh, make it a bit more dynamic. And and as I go along, um, uh, just as a warning, I'm not too I'm not too used to talking while I'm painting, but I'm going to try my best to. Well, can you chew gum uh, and paint at the same time? <laughs> I don't know, Eric. I should try, but then I, I would risk my life. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you choking. <laughs> Okay, so, so what are you, what are you painting on? People are going to want to know, and what color is that? Right. You're doing in there? So uh, currently, I'm using a rough uh, Saunders watercolor paper. Um, this is 300 GSM uh, watercolor paper, and uh, most of my paints are actually a mix of different brands. So it would be, you know, uh, Windsor Newton and uh, uh, Daniel Smith, Holbein, Jackman. Uh, so certain certain pigments are good with certain brands, and. Uh, um, yeah, and for brushes, I would use rosemary brushes or escota. Um, although I've been recently experimenting with this Corian uh, brush herons, and uh, that's been great too. Um, so now that I've wet the sky, what I'm trying to do here is I'm mixing a little bit of yellow ochre and uh, rose matter genuine. I really love rose matter genuine. It's like nice transparent kind of pinkish color. Um, and then I'm just laying down some of those lighter values, um, which are closer to horizon. And uh, even though I could start from the top, I feel like when you add these lighter bits of warmth first, and then you go in with like a darker, the way it mixes and the way it runs into the pigment is quite nice. So uh, that's what I'm trying to do here right now. Um, and then adding a little bit of pink to it. Now I'm gonna go in with uh, the purple mix. Um, and what this is, is essentially um, imperial purple mixed in with some Alzarin crimson, rose matter, and uh, I'm neutralizing it with its complement, which would be yellow ochre in this case. And why I'm mixing multiple pigments is because all the all these watercolor pigments they have different weight and the way they granulate on paper is is quite different, um, so you would see how the colors then start to split essentially when you do that, um, and and run into it. So here you can see that's what I'm trying to do. Um, now at this stage I can also then go in and make it a bit more wet. Here's a I'm just spraying some water on top just to help the color bleed into each other and sort of flow flow naturally. Um, now this is a wet into wet technique and uh, obviously if you have any questions please do feel free to ask because while painting I can often get lost and uh, um, I'm happy to answer any any question as we go. Um, now you can see really in the comments everybody and also while you're there tell us where you're watching from. Um, so at this stage, you can see how, how the purple and the reds are actually starting to split right here, where it connects. And, and some of the heavier pigments will uh, granulate and stay on the paper up top. Now I'm mixing a bit of a darker sort of color for the sky, just to add a bit more of that stormy, stormy uh, look to it. So that's what I'm going to do. And you can always come back and increase and uh, decrease your consistency and what kind of um, um, pigments you have in your in your brush. Obviously, you do have to be mindful with watercolors, like how much water you have on your paper and uh, um, how much water is in your brush. In this case, I'm working quite thin. 
Um, now I'm diving into this haystack, and I know overall the color of the haystack is quite um, yellow ochre almost, so I'm just going to go over it. But then I'm, I'm trying to leave uh, some hints of uh, bits of like white here and there. Uh, what what and kind of an usually, angle do you have on your paper? Um, I'm working at about 40 degree angle right now. Okay. I've actually made it much more flat. Usually I work a bit more vertical, but just for the demo, I thought um, this would be easier to, to see on the camera. So um, that's what I'm trying to do here. And again, as I get closer to horizon, I can uh, um, leave some of these uh, bits of white here and there. And uh, But you have to be mindful that you're leaving it. You, you can't just make it random. Just make sure you overall understand, OK, light is coming from this direction. And so I'm just leaving it more to the right and top. Here's and a question. It is why, why put down a light wash if you're going to cover it with purple? Um, well, I did put uh, some of the light wash underneath because I think in some areas it does show through. And also, you would notice how purple uh, mixes with some of these light colors. And it would create these more variety in paper. And I think uh, that looks much more prettier than me just going in with purple because that would make it look very flat. Um, now I'm going to rush to this. This is actually out because um, of the time, but then at the same, uh, I just want to finish this one wash so then I can switch switch to a different uh, view because what I really want to show today was more about how you can create drama and less, less about watercolor techniques, uh, but then I will definitely talk about it as I go. Um, so on that note, maybe I can actually talk about how what creates drama while I'm painting. Um, so certain tools that we have as artists, you know, like all the basic design things, for example, you have value, you have your um, your um, colors, which would be the hue. So you can you can use when when I when I say drama, what I really mean is um, contrasting forces. Now how do you create contrast is through um, you know it could be a value different light versus dark. It could be hue. You can have like complementary colors. Um, it could be edges. So now you have like edges which are hard edges, and then you have soft edges right next to it. Um, you know, it could be shapes, which is, you know, you have these structure which is very angular and blocky, and at the same time you have trees with these delicate lines and and, and all those kind of things. Um, and so the more the more you play with these tools, you know, the more uh, interesting uh, it's gonna get. Um, in terms of creating an impact and creating a drama. Um, now, as you, as you can see, as I'm working through this, I'm actually getting darker as I go to the base, again, to lead people into it. And I'm not too, I'm not being too mindful of uh, my life. Like, if I know a certain area is going to be dark, then I'm not too mindful of what kind of light pigment I'm doing. I'm more focused on the uh, area of interest and uh, what color goes there because that's going to be my final color on paper hello morocco so, uh, first time i've seen morocco see australia oh wow a lot of a lot of london all your friends in london are tuning in <laughs> well hello everyone toronto uh, thanks for tuning in and uh i'm curious what the temperature uh, is in morocco right now it's really hot where i am yeah, it is getting hot actually even here. I'm, uh, hey, everybody hot. put in your temperature where you're watching from. Suzanne says 61 degrees in Colorado. Whoa. Oh, must be Fahrenheit. <laughs> I nice. freaked out for a second. Um, so, yeah, you can see this is kind of taking shape in terms of its first wash. Uh, now, while this paper is still wet, I'm going to actually go in with a little bit of blue and I'm going to put in uh, some of these uh, areas that are going to be seen through almost like a background area. Uh, and this could be like distant bushes and trees or wh whatever um, they are. Uh, but I don't want to get too detailed with it because if I, if I start like drawing each and every branch and uh, making it sophisticated, it's going to take away from like the initial like impact and the focus, focus area that, that I was uh, talking about. So, what, so how, do you, um, how do you determine if a painting is sophisticated? When I say sophisticated, I, I really mean is like uh, detailed. For example, I could look at this picture and then I could go in and I could start copying each and everything and um, um, it will end up looking just like the photograph. And it is sophisticated technically because yeah, you do need that ability to be able to you know, judge what kind of value and color it is and then put it up on the paper. But then 
there is no element of design and personal storytelling, which I think uh, is quite um, quite crucial. Um, um, yeah, for example, I mean, here, why don't I use this opportunity to show like, uh, here's some portraiture work. So for example, here is a painting that I did of um, uh, using watercolors. Now you can see this is, I did from a photograph, but then, uh, I mean, technically, yeah, it would make sense. Yes, you, you're looking at your values and this and copying, but then there's not much interest in terms of composition, the way I have cropped it. Uh, it was done a while back. So, you know, I literally cropped it right where the neck is and uh, um, uh, it might not be showing the whole thing on this, but it's not, at least to me, it's not super interesting. Um, so. Hello, India. Um, so Eric, at this stage, what I'm going to do, because this might take a while to dry it, the humidity is quite, quite strong. Uh, no. What I wanted to show with this approach was how you can create this kind of gradients, how you can mix in the colors, more focused on watercolor techniques. So I'm going to flip this into a more advanced stage where I have actually worked upon this painting a little bit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why we're adding some figures there and shadows. And also I'm going to maybe show you some technique of how you can achieve this haystack in a much less um, sort of copy one by one kind of way using some okay. scratching. All right. Well, things. while you're getting set off, I'm going to take set up. I'll take you off camera and tell people a couple of things that are going on and then we'll reconnect oh, sure. here in a minute. Sounds great. I like a plan. All yeah, right. Perfect. Our guest is Hirsch Agrol. Agrol. Agarwal. Say it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's Agarwal. Agarwal. Yeah. Or you can say a gray wall. A gray wall. Yeah. Well, that's not <laughs> quite right. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll be back with you in just a second. Hey, thanks for tuning Wonderful. in, you guys. Uh, this is Art School Live. We're here every day at 12 noon. And you can subscribe on YouTube or wherever you wish. Um, we're on Facebook at Eric Rhodes Publisher. Uh, just subscribe and then follow Eric Rhodes with an A. All right. Um, we got some things coming up. Uh, first off, uh, we have uh, Realism Live is coming up. It's just coming up around the corner. And uh, you want to make sure you attend that. That is uh, going to be in November. Some of the top realist artists, real meaning realist is if you can tell what it is, it's real, right? If it's abstract -y or, or totally abstract, maybe it's different stories. So these are realists and, and some are very abstract. Some are not. Um, some are very tight, but we have a variety and we'd love for you to come. That's November 9 through 11. And there's an essential techniques day on November 8th. We also have an event coming up in January. It's going to be called watercolor live. So if you're a watercolorist, you don't want to miss that. Um, and I'm going to be taking a group to Japan. Uh, we need to get Hirsch to come with us. Uh, it's a rare opportunity to paint cherry blossom season in Japan. It's a once in a lifetime trip. I'm not going to repeat it, uh, and we have an incredible trip planned, a lot of sightseeing, but we paint every single day. Uh, we're even going to tour the Holbein factory in Japan, which is pretty cool. And, uh, of course, we have all kinds of great experiences set up for you. And uh, from what I understand, I think we can squeeze in one, maybe two more people. Um, so there's a waiting list, and it's a good idea to get on the waiting list in case somebody gets sick and can't make it, and then you can jump in. So there's that. Just go to plenairjapan.com. And then, uh, of course, uh, I have a fine art trip, and we have a few seats left for that, and that's uh, coming up October 20th through 29th. Uh, we're going to do Stockholm and Madrid behind the scenes, the museums, the art, uh, visit local artists, visit some collectors' homes. We've got a lot of different things planned. It's an incredible trip. Luxury trip for sure, and uh, you can find out about that at findarttrip.com. Coming up uh, in the end of this month, the 29th, this Fall Color Week, that's actually sold out. Uh, I don't think, I think we have a waiting list, but I don't think we're likely to get any more seats. But again, waiting list in case somebody drops out, you want to go ahead and get that. Okay, well, now let's get back to our guest, uh, Hirsch Agrawal. Or a gray wall, as he says. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Um, so um, now you can see this is kind of using the same process where at, we did the wash. Uh, we created sort of the groundwork. And uh, and then what, I, what I've done is I've kind of painted this bit just because in the interest of time, I didn't want to um, consume. Because usually I think my painting time when I'm out is about two hours to three hours. Um, but then I would definitely share um, some of the 
um, techniques that I've used to do this. So next thing that we're going to do actually is I'm going to work on some of these trees and we're going to create uh, the main shadows um, and then uh, add some of these people over here to uh, make it a bit more dynamic. And obviously, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Um, so right now what I'm doing is I'm just mixing a green. I'm keeping the consistency very thick, almost like butter. Um, and uh, really scrubbing my brush to shock it into a very, I don't know if you can see it in the camera here, but, um, um, and then what we'll do is we're just gonna go in and start sort of scrubbing it against the, um, the grain of the paper. And, and that's gonna get you some, some of these sort of interesting kind of marks. Um, and uh, while I've done that, I would also introduce some of the lighter colors and water in some area, but because again, you, you always want to make sure if you have dry edges, you also want to keep certain soft edges in there. You also want to uh, introduce cauliflowers as they say in watercolors, because I actually like some of those effects and how, how it bleeds into the paper. I think it's quite, uh, that's kind of the main reason why I prefer uh, watercolors, because certain, certain effects that you can get in watercolor uh, are just magical and it's not something that you can plan it's not something that um yeah that I, I at least i've not been able to achieve in other mediums so to speak um and yeah as i'm moving more towards the um, horizon i'm also making it darker because that just anchors the entire tree you don't want it to look like a floating tree um, i'm also going to be careful as i'm working over here because uh you know there is this person so i'm going to just like carve carve around the person and, and 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 like work my work my way around it essentially who is this person i have no idea but they're definitely using a pitchfork i think and they are trying to clean up some of this um hay before it rains so yeah, I just left like that little bit of like white there and you can see how now I'm not being too careful because uh, as we saw in the initial um, sort of thumbnail, I'm actually trying to connect this. So this is also going to be darker value. So even if I miss a few strokes or something like that, you know, it's completely fine. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to actually continue into this right now, um, the side haystack. So I'm taking a bit of ochre. Um, as you notice, I didn't clean my brush because there was a little bit of green, and I do want that to be mixed into the uh, into the ochre, and that creates this kind of like a muddy, haystacky kind of um, color. And then we're just gonna, again, not being too careful. Um, the thing is, yeah, if you if you are too careful, you'll end up making it perfect, and I don't know, perfection can be boring. So I, I you um, know, that's why I'm so boring. Um, the, so, <laughs> so uh, oh, no. somebody's asking, uh, Barbara Tapp is asking, is your paper completely dry? I think you switched to another yes. pre-painted scene that was yes. already dry. Yeah, exactly. I would have waited a little bit or I could have used hair dryer, but I just find the noise of hair dryer so annoying that I'd rather wait. <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, add more. Now, as you can see, like some of these areas, I'm also splattering a little bit of water um, that's going to create these kind of fuzzy little um, pigments bleeding into each other. Um, although I'm just dropping in paint, I'm also trying to mix paints, which have, uh, which is usually what I do is mix paint, which are heavier pigments and also like lighter pigments. So I want to have a mix of all kinds of pigments. Like you can have heavier blue, for example, cerulean, and then you can have something which is more staining like alzarin crimson. And I would want to merge these things together so that whenever it explodes on paper, meaning uh, when I add water, it blooms, or when it merges, pigments then separate at different speed and different velocities. And that creates this, uh, you know, uh, what we call watercolor magic, I guess, which is uh, with time they, they spread and create these interesting forms and in interesting shapes. Uh, now, because I'm adding so much yellow, I'm going to actually go in with a little bit of purple, which is its complement, and I'm going to just drop in uh, some purple uh, in, in, in the shadow areas and also just create a little bit. I'm also thinking about perspective as I do it, so I can like um, at least have some sense of 3D shape and not just make it look like a cutout. Um, again, I'm just scrubbing this through. Now, at this stage, you could just start like scratching it, and you will see you, you can see how it creates these strands of hay. Um, now, 
instead of me trying to dodge around it, I, I can just cut cut in, and then I can go in with some dry brush later on to to make it even even more um, um, appealing or believable that okay, it is haste dye. But at the same time, I'm trying not to be too literal, uh, as I probably have repeated this multiple times, and. Uh, the reason being it creates a lot of mystery. You, you don't want to just tell the entire story to to your audience. You definitely want to, you know, keep some suspense so that they can figure it out for themselves or at least have a hunch of, you know, <laughs> what it's about. Um, so as I, as I go down, I know there's going to be a big shadow over here. So I'm just going to... Uh, not not too worried about how I leave this edge. Usually you want to be careful about, you know, maybe you can use a dry brush and now you have this broken edge and then you can work around it. But in this case, I'm not too bothered because I know there's going to be a large shadow kind of coming in. I'm just more focused on this top area. This white is definitely too bright, so I'm just going to take a little bit of uh, dirty blue color and uh, um, plop that in. And then coming in with fresh water and mix that in. And yeah, there we go. And yeah, and then I, I'm trying not to touch and go back and fiddle with it and just sort of look at it properly, see how it bleeds. And, you know, if I'm not too happy, then I can go in and attack at it again and, and see how it goes. Uh, this one tool I do use uh, to scratch has just been sitting there. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if you are able to see this on camera, probably not focused at this Time. It's just sort of like one of the sculpting tools. I think we got it like um, during Halloween to carve pumpkins, and it's just been sitting with me. So <laughs> I'm just uh, using that right now. And you can see how easy it is to create some of these haystack things. And that's exactly the technique that I used to, to create this right over here. Um, it's just that I was being more careful and uh, with like where I place some of these lights. You don't want to lay too light everywhere. I also don't want to scratch too much here because I don't want too much light in the bottom. I'm actually going to scrape a bit more off the top. Yep. And okay, time to not fiddle around. I'm going to mix a large shadow wash, which is, so I'm taking a bit of cobalt blue, some cerulean blue, a bit of imperial violet or purple. And then I'm just neutralizing it with a, some yellow ochre. And that's going to create some kind of shadow color. Now, in this case, there is green grass and then there is this rose. So I, I would probably need two shadow colors. One would be for green and then like one for this ma main area, which is uh, purple for the for the streets. Adding a, um, some alzarin, not too much. And then this is my dark green color. Um, I'm going to add a little more purple to the green. And uh, yeah, we're going to do a little test here just to make sure it's per... Yeah, that, that seems about right. So. Yeah, let's take this and then uh, create like a mark here. And we can, and then these areas, I'm going to just let it merge for a bit. There's um, seen quite a bit of reflection, which doesn't help right now. That's OK. Hopefully, you don't see reflection on the stream. Um, then I'm going to wet this area. Um, the reason I'm wetting this area is just so that the edges are slightly soft and uh, they can uh, bleed in, coming in with purple. Because you see how when I created this big patch of green, again, like I'm always looking for variety and interest because that, that's what creates dynamics, you know. It's, the concept of dynamics is it's kind of same as like in music, you know. You, you, you have a bunch of keys and you, you're trying to compose something and uh, you want to make sure you have your mids, lows, highs, and correct variety, and you don't want to just bore people with like similar tone, uh, or else it becomes monotonous. Um, monotonous is not that good. That's what I've learned working uh, in the industry, which job I do enjoy painting a lot more. So here, now, now that I've dropped in some purple and different things, you can see how it's creating a bit of uh, interest in, in, in this area. But I'm going to work a bit faster now and uh, use the purple that we had made and adding more of there into the mix. And continue this way. Yeah, don't um, 
there is this sort of line coming in. I might want to keep that a bit. Um, so I know that this is wet, so I can still work on it. With watercolor, it's like once, as long as it's wet, it's okay. You can lift the color. You can do, um, you know, change it. But once it's dry, it's kind of dead, and it's very hard to, very hard to lift it at that stage. Um, again, some green over here, um, and. Uh, Talk to me one more time about the shadow. So the shadow over the grass looks green, but looks like your mm -hmm. shadow, it's hard to tell the color on screen, looks like your shadow has a bit of purple in it. Yes, definitely. So I put green, but then I added a little bit of purple uh, into it because I think that's, all, again, if you look at this entire painting, I'm actually keeping purple as my mother color, almost like this pink purpley look that is, um, coming through this watercolor. So I'm trying to just induce those in green. So if I'm painting a large patch, I don't want that large patch to be like same color um, um, throughout. Uh, so I'm gonna just add uh, opposing color a little bit. And that goes into that concept of, um, you know, creating contrast and creating uh, drama because I don't think drama would, yes, there is an overall big picture of drama which comes through composition, but then also, each little section of the picture, they, they all need love, all your side characters, all your, uh, you know, like the layout and everything. So, uh, you know, the more you can add in terms of variety, the more dynamic your painting is going to be. And, uh, you know, that's always nice. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to just bore your people and uh, walk away from your painting. You want them talk to, to us, it for a little uh, bit. Hirsch, talk to us about the concept of a mother color. That's not a term used oftentimes. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, well, I would say uh, for me, at least <laughs> the concept of mother color is this one color that uh, permeates your entire painting. Uh, we're not talking about literal color. I mean, yes, we know like sky is blue, grass is green and all this, but uh, not really. I mean, there, if you, if you look closely, there would be a, a sort of um, a, a color that sort of brings everything together and combines it. And I think uh, or anchors the painting, so to speak, uh, together. So, um, um, which is important for mood and also so your painting doesn't look too disjoint. Um, so I'm always actively looking for uh, a mother color whenever I'm painting, even outdoors. Uh, and and you know, that that is something that I introduced into all my colors a little bit. So even though like it's yellow, if my mother color is a little bit of like this pink purple, I would like to introduce it here and there so you can see it through. Um, areas um, of your painting. Hope um, that kind of helped. Um, so now what I'm doing is I'm again like mixing some of this shadow color um, and I'm gonna just add it underneath these areas because I feel like they're kind of floating right now. So I'm just gonna add some bits of shadow right here. Uh, underneath this, um, even this object over here. Um, there is this person working, I, I, although I haven't really painted the person, I'm just gonna go ahead and add their shadow in anticipation. Maybe there's a little bit of um, fences or something over there. It seems a bit too purple at this stage, um, but so I'm gonna add a little bit of um, yellow ochre to it because I think the shadow is looking tiny bit too purple. Um, I'm sorry if those yeah, uh, colors are not that visible on camera, um, but then that's yeah, the best I can do at this stage. Um, yeah, and then this whole thing, I think this, this bit of uh, haystack is kind of far in the back, so I'm just trying not to show the shadow. And I know that's not realistic, but uh, that's a uh, sort of artistic decision or liberty, let's say, that I'm going to take and not not put in the shadow for that because yeah, that's going to take me away from the painting a little too much. Even I'm quite conscious about this because it might take away my eye from here. I do, this is my secondary focal point, but I don't want it to be too, um, take away too much from the painting, essentially. Um, Again, when, when I'm painting, I'm keeping it quite broken. I'm not trying to create these blocks. I'm always looking for variety, whether it be in my shapes, colors, values, uh, or what have you. So I'm always looking for a variety when I'm uh, painting, um, essentially. So this, what this did is it kind of anchored a lot of these 
to the ground and I think um, that looks a bit better that way so how much time do you have Eric I'm gonna I was gonna show some people over here so I might just yeah you've uh, got you've got about 10 more minutes okay cool so yeah we can add some people I think even though on the scene actually I didn't have this many people I introduced them because I think it kind of adds to that story and and they they can be my uh, actors for for this particular show and um, I don't know I, I usually like to move things around and uh, uh, um, arrange shapes and subjects and I'm, I'm not too um, stuck on what I'm seeing uh, and uh, you know, or whatever works, I'm, I'm always focused on my picture plane and, and, and the painting that I'm doing versus um, what I see out there. I mean, what I see out there is great. And the thing is, I can never compete with nature. Um, you know, that's how that's how you lose. But. So yeah, right now I'm adding these people. I'm not sure how clear that would be on screen because <laughs> these are quite tiny, uh, the humans that I'm adding, but hopefully you can tell what's going on. Um, I'm actually going to leave this white edge over here of the person and then I'll work on the legs. And You know what? I'm going to actually take a different sheet and then show what I'm doing when I'm creating the people. Um, on the screen. This needed to be a bit darker, but I'm going to leave it for now. Um, so when, when you're making figures, I think it's also important not to make them look too stiff. Um, yes, you can study anatomy and like try to get, you know, uh, be anatomically correct in terms of your proportions and all these things, but especially, well, at least for this range, which is mid-ground to your background, if you're creating figures, I'm kind of more interested in the gesture of the pose and how fluid they are and how, how the lines kind of go into each other and how they flow. That that seems like more important to me. And it's actually not that hard to do to, um, you know, create this um, sort of effect because you, you just want to suggest with like a few brush marks, like how um, you know, maybe they're wearing a the clothes and they're, they're doing certain kind of activity and, uh, you know, um, and that's more of my um, foc focal area, how to say, when, I, when I'm painting these figures versus something like where it's a portraiture or like a figurative work, then yeah, I'm obviously more concerned about all the details of the anatomy. Um, so right now I'm just like, okay, there's a face, there's the shoulder. Yeah, you want to add a little bit of contrapasta and you know, instead of keeping your shoulders straight, you, you want to just tilt it a little bit and, you know, uh, same for the edge. Um, Here's a question for I you, have, uh, Hirsch. Yep. A uh, yes, question sir. from Jay Toro. When choosing a mother color, is it better to choose a secondary mm -hmm. color instead of a primary or does it mainly just depend on the scene? I think, yeah, it depends on the scene, but also your personal um, sort of feeling that you get when you see it. Um, and, and what kind of mood you're trying to communicate. I mean, you could have created this entire scene using maybe yellow as another color, and it would probably create a different effect and make it more somber, make it more, um, also give it that sort of warm undertone. So, um, but then usually it, uh, well, for me, it's more of a response as an artist when I'm out there and what kind of response I get when I look at different things and I'm thinking of color. And you, you would notice actually when you're looking at something, uh, you might see that it's, red or blue or certain color but then if you think of a color in your head and you look at that object for longer you actually start seeing the other colors in that object okay that, that might sound a bit <laughs> that might sound a bit strange but uh, uh yeah you should try it uh, right. uh if you know if it doesn't work you know definitely write me an email and i'll apologize okay well just apologize now <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so um you know what, I'm going to take this paper and because the humans are so tiny there, I feel like it's hard for people to uh, see, especially if they're watching on their phone. What I'm going to do is uh, show you what I mean when I create these dynamic um, human forms. So I'm going to do the same thing, but a little bit bigger. So first I started with the head and then I'm going in with um, some sort of red, red color that I think um, this person might be wearing. And uh, as you can see in the shoulder, now this person is like in the back, they're holding this like pitchfork thing. And so I'm just trying to kind of come up with uh, 
a shape that is somehow more natural, natural looking pose, essentially. Um, maybe we should give it a cap or something. Yeah, let's do that. And uh, again, going in. As it goes down, I'm going to make it a bit dark. Maybe we give it shorts, like dark shorts. Yeah, why not? Um, and and then let's mix in a color for now again as you notice i'm not being too careful about anatomy i am careful about proportions but you know i think um yeah it's still gonna be far enough so i'm just trying to be there's that's one i'm going here then maybe the other hand coming out here and then you would have your um, legs over here and then you can use some kind of keeping my brush fairly dry and picking almost straight pigments with the dark and you can kind of create this you know which four key things and then that should already like work for the most part for you know um what it is and then i can go in with some green i mean th there were other things around so you would cut and in this case i've actually made the head a lot bigger than uh what it was supposed to be and then i would leave some highlights on the on the um these areas too and then yeah you know whatever i'm just trying to think of that scene a little bit and how how it responds but whatever gets the story done and now i haven't really made a good looking figure per se but then what i'm trying to say here is like i'm being very expressive and i'm trying to focus more on the gesture and something like that is already good enough to work at this distance obviously i would think a lot about my posture probably even use some references right now i'm just you know uh, going with uh, whatever i have in my head and that would improve the way um, your painting looks and um, um, figures definitely add a lot to to the landscapes i think so um let me add a little bit of blue here and yeah so there we go i think uh this gives you at least some idea of like what uh you know um, you, you start with initial wash then you work with your grounds you think about the composition add your shadows add some people to make it a bit dynamic and while you're doing it you're always thinking of how you can add more contrast and dynamics to it um, think about you know edges so in this case this is a straight line this is a hard edge and right next to it i've placed these very delicate lines and branches in the back and that really pushes the shape forward you also want to think about your values where you're placing your darks and your lights you want to think about your color in terms of complementary colors or uh, whatever it is that how you can create interest into into your painting um, now whatever i've told now um, essentially is um it, it should it's not like a formula or like sort of like a quick fix but then um i'm i'm by no means like a master but but i think uh, i just hope that um it helps people in in terms of uh, you know, assist them into creating their own story uh, when they're outside, uh, if they have this in the back of their head when they're making uh, watercolors. Um, yeah, so how, how are we doing on time, Eric? Yeah, we're doing okay. I'm going to brag on you for just a second uh, about your figures. Um, Hirsch uh, was an artist at Pixar, and I think you developed some of the characters for Toy Story 4, did you not? Oh yeah, <laughs> where did you uh, pick that from? I'm trying to actually take off all my digital work because I did work at Pixar and then uh, a bit of Lucasfilm. So we did a bunch of films like, I started with animation. So um, we did Toy Story and uh, um, Coco. And then I moved into Lucasfilm where we did more live action films like Star Wars, Avengers, and, and these sort of things. And a lot of the rings was sort of my latest TV show um, that we worked on. Cool. Sorry to embarrass um, you. I, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, I did want to show some, uh, I have some pictures where I can show, because right now I think one thing that I don't want people to think is like to create drama, you just need a lot of contrast, uh, which is, uh, you know, like very heavy contrast, dark versus light. That's not really true. You can actually, uh, you know, you can add contrast to any of these tools, but not. you don't have to use all of them. Like for example, a painting could be, 
um, something which doesn't have heavy value contrast, but it could have contrast through other means and that's totally fine. So um, I might, so for example, um, there is this one and it's not too high on value contrast, but then still dramatic sky. Now, if you just look at the sky, the values are actually quite close to each other, but then, uh, you know, just through the placement of colors and also the edges, because, you know, this is all soft edge and there's this hard edge coming in. So a lot more contrast was created through edges and, and colors in this one to, to tell the story. Um, this, a, this one, which I did recently, which is an eight by eight, so it's quite tiny um, and it's not conventionally like a planar kind of like a landscape scene, but then still the concept is kind of the same where you place, how you place your values, you know, and then this is sort of my primary area where your eyes goes. But then at the same time, you can see I made this character face that way. So you, you look this way and then this dog over here is like looking diagonally over here. So that creates like a nice triangle for your eye to move around. All my uh, borders are dark and they're kind of leading in whereas this is my most impactful contrast area and this would be my second area of interest and this is my tertiary area of interest and that's how you can like move around um, these paintings um yeah and then uh, i could i mean that let me see if there is another i'm trying to think of different paintings where the contrast uh, that's actually not that great i'm gonna move to uh, Yes, yeah, so again, this one is a night scene uh, in, in France. And uh, um, here you can see I'm doing the same thing where I'm really being bold with my darks and like keeping it dark all around and really hone in on this. I wouldn't say there's many different areas of focus, but then uh, it does have that impact of instant contrast. And in this, it's definitely the value that uh, really helps um, with, the, with the painting. Um, Here's a beach scene in Laguna Beach. And uh, again, same structure. In this case, you'd notice the edges are actually not dark. And so I flipped it where edges are kind of lighter and then I'm really pushing in through dark. So, you know, when I talk about gradient that you can bring sky like dark to light, you don't have to keep it dark to light. You can flip it and then that, that's still fine. You, you, it, it brings your eye right here and then this becomes my high area of focus. And then this becomes my secondary area of focus. And again, a vertical to bring it in. So. Yeah, I hope, uh, you know, that helps in terms, you know, you create like paintings and create adding a little bit of narrative or drama into your painting. Um, and if you have any questions, please do uh, let me know and I'd be more than happy to to help. How about uh, you come on screen real quick so that everybody can meet you if they didn't see you in the beginning. Yeah, let's do All right. Um, there you are. Okay. <laughs> well, I have to I have to tell everybody that Hirsch is in London and was just moving to a new house, found out he was going to be on the broadcast and reset up his studio just so he could be here today. Uh, yes, and as you can see with my tripod setup and the and the camera, I've just balanced it right about <laughs> to show. So, yeah, that's why I wasn't able to zoom in or show you all the details, but I hope it wasn't too bad. And you oh, you did a you did a terrific job. Next time so, I see you, yeah. you're going to be staying at the world famous artist cabin in Austin. Oh, Texas. that is true. <laughs> uh, so I'm so I'll, excited I'll, to go to Austin. Really, really. I'll, on. I'll see you in about a month, and uh, right. then you're going to go to uh, in Plain Air, Texas, uh, in Abilene, that's right? right? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, San Angelo, uh, Plein Air, Texas. San Angelo. And, uh, it's, um, yeah, that paint out should be, should be really fun. Uh, it's a I'm great show. To, it makes a lot matches. of money, but you're going to have to get boots and a hat. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. So I'll, take, I'll take you by the Western stores and we'll, we'll get you all outfitted. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Imagine a Western me. I don't know how that's going to look. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to try it. When in the West, you have to be, you have to be in the West. I'll right. take it upon you then. Uh, definitely, uh, we should visit some stores when I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Hirsch, thank you so much. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in person. And uh, thanks for being here today. We learned a lot. It was really oh, terrific. No. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure being here. And um, uh, honestly, this is my first live. And I just hope that um, people were able to take something out of it. And it wasn't too boring. <laughs> and I think uh, I have to confirm this, but I think you're going to be at the Plein Air Convention. Is that right? Yes. I, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it because, uh, yeah, last year was amazing. The Plein Air Convention is just such a great event. You meet so many amazing artists, all the vendors and you know, um, and I've never been to Smokey. So yeah, I would also encourage everyone to join. <laughs>
Well, that's where we met. I saw you painting at Plein Air Convention and was so blown yeah. away by your work that uh, we wanted to have you have you back. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> All right. So we'll see you. And uh, thanks again, Hirsch. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll catch thanks. up with you uh, soon. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, our guest today is Hirsch Agrawal. Agrawal. And uh, thank you again for, for tuning in. And uh, I just want to play something for you real quick about Realism Live. Well, we hope to have you at Realism Live coming up in November. Make sure you sign up before the price increase. Also, thanks to Hirsch today for being on with us. If you liked it, make sure you forward it to others or tell others about it. And uh, we have a free book for you of watercolorlive.com 101 tips. Uh, just go to uh, watercolorlive.com slash 101 tips. Okay. And make sure to subscribe to this program. We're here every weekday at 12 noon. Just go to YouTube and look up Art School Live. I'm Eric Rhodes. We will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.